the Lord takes care of that. Now, I, uh, I'm going to pray for my wife. The Lord will help her to stay awake. She was not doing well resting last night, and so I've been hoping that, uh, but if she closes her eyes, I'm sure it'll be in meditation, <laughs> and uh, we, there'll be probably some meditating with her. There will be, did you bring some of the uh, CDs of uh, the bottom line in at all? The CD bottom line. Uh, what I'm going to minister on this morning, huh? DVD, right. What I'm going to minister on this morning is uh, a little uniquely different in that there was a phone call that I'm going to talk to you about that, uh, not a phone, yeah, a phone call from a lady who called into a pastor who was on the radio. And Wanda was in the shopping area and I was listening to the radio in the car and listening to this pastor receiving this call. And what happened as a result of that call is what has birthed this particular message in my heart today, and uh, I want you to know that it's not just a sermon. It is a message from our hearts to yours that I think is of utmost importance. I'm going to be reading several scriptures. Utmost importance. Uh, But I want to um, read to you from the message, which is Mr. Peterson's uh, modern day version of the book of Jude as a foundation for what's on our hearts today. Now I want to apologize if the uh, about uh, five or six weeks ago I uh, kind of uh, had a uh, uh, the ground came up to meet me and uh, there was this in my pocket, which is my glass case, and there's a spring steel part of it, and I fell on that, and it fractured a rib, and uh, if you've ever had a fractured rib, you know that it's quite painful in any position you get in, uh, and uh, sometimes it affects my my breathing, and my uh, heart is in this message and I'm going to, we, we questioned, uh, that is, we were asking the Lord, is it possible to, to do the traveling we're going to do in the last couple of months and still have the Lord to bless our lives in what the Lord was going to do? And so we said, we're going to take it a day at a time, and we're going to preach what God's laid on our heart and believe that we're going to get through this. And, and I would... Uh, like my wife, if she would, to ask God's blessing on the message this morning, please. Amen. Amen. And let it be food and nourishment to the spiritual man that is within us. And Lord, that we might go forth from this place. Amen. Lord, as living servants that would spread your word wherever we go. And Lord, we just ask for strength and, and help. Hallelujah. Us. Lord, as uh, your message again spoke the word again. We just give you the praise for everything that's done here in this service today. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 My wife and I want to express our thanks to Pastor, his wife and family in this church for the privilege of being with you this morning in this church. 
It isn't the size of the church. It's the size of the desire of the people in the church that blesses us. And you can't come to this church from the very beginning without being blessed. And I thank God for that and thank God for uh, any help that has been given for our missions outreach and traveling around trying to work with uh, marriages within the Christian circles and going to churches regardless of their size. I've uh, been to churches of two or 3,000, been to churches of two or 300, and sometimes churches of two or three. But the thing is, it's not so much the size as what's going to happen with the people that are there because you never know who's sitting in front of you. I just uh, uh, had mentioned to your pastor and his wife yesterday uh, when I was at a church in California and had asked the Lord about moving us to another church. Maybe I uh, had uh, didn't realize that one of the couples that we had in that church named Bob and Evelyn Burt were in the Navy. And uh, while they were there, they came to that church for a couple of years. And But before they left, he, he uh, and his wife talked with me and said that he felt to leave the uh, Navy there and uh, go back to college and become a chaplain. And that was about 40 years ago. And... Uh, I found out in the last couple of months that in his 60s, uh, he has passed away. And I talked with his wife on the phone. And Evelyn said to me, Brother Ryan, I cannot tell you how much my husband and I felt that we learned and were blessed in the couple of years we attended the church in California and want to thank you for it. And I, I said, I know you were chaplains, but... Uh, but when he passed away, uh, what rank did he have? And she said he was an admiral, and he was the chief of chaplains for all of the Navy. I just, my mouth dropped open, and I'm saying, you never know who's sitting in front of you or what God's going to do with them. For him to become chief of chaplains, because he felt led to go in, how important is doing what you feel God wants you to do. You say, well, I, you know, if the Lord wants me to be chief of chaplains, I'm happy to do that. Well, if the Lord wants you to clean the church, how about that? Who's that important to? It's important to the Lord that when people come here, you always have a nice-looking church. Somebody is doing a good job, and everybody said, Amen. The problem with some of us is that we have a church full of willing workers, those willing to work and those willing to let them. <laughs> Amen. Well, if you can keep your smile after that, we may get through this message. And everybody said, I want to read you the uh, portion of the book of Jude that tonight, uh, I guess there's going to be a uh, special meeting. Uh, and I'm going to address, I think, the leadership of the church. And uh, or those want to be leaders, I guess. We're going to be at the pastor's house. And we're uh, just looking for the Lord to touch the lives of people because the other half of what I have to say is going to be in that meeting tonight. And I'm going to talk about what Jesus, I believe, what Jesus says is the answer to spiritual growth and development within the church. There's one word that I'm going to use and, and, and talk about that and have a discussion about it, and I think it will bless our hearts and our lives as we cover those. Here's uh, what the uh, message by Peterson has said here. I, Jude, am a slave to Jesus Christ and brother of James, writing to those loved by God the Father, called and kept safe by Jesus Christ. Relax. Everything's going to be all right. Rest, ev rest. everything's coming together. Open your heart. Love is on the way. Dear friends, I've, that was his, his beginning of his letter, to uh, Jude's letter. Dear friends, I've dropped everything 
to write to you about this life of salvation that we have in common. I have to write insisting, even begging, that you fight with everything you have in you for the faith entrusted to us as a gift to guard and cherish. What has happened to that is that some people have infiltrated our ranks. Our scriptures warned us that this would happen, who beneath their pious skin are shameless scoundrels. Their design is to replace the sheer grace of God with sheer license, which means doing away with Jesus Christ, our one and only master. And I want to tell you, if there's anything that's going on in our country today, leave alone all over the world, it's to remove the name of Jesus from anything they can remove it from because Jesus is in their way. It's either him or nothing, and they're not accepting that. Even when he was born, he came unto his own, his own received him not, but unto as many as received him unto them. Gave he power to become the sons of God, even to believe on his name. Now, there's something very important about the birth of Jesus. And I want you to understand that the gospel, and we'll uh, again deal with part of this tonight. But the gospel, and as you sang that song this morning, it was just over and over. It's all about you. It's all about you. It's, and I'm hearing that in my mind, in my heart. It's all about you. Now, if we can, if we as a church, I don't mean just this body, but as a church of the Lord Jesus Christ, in everywhere we can, we're trying to sow another seed of the joy of the Lord in the gospel with making Jesus that, that voice that needs to be heard and spread throughout the world that there's none other name given among men whereby we must be saved other than the name of Jesus. I mean, that's clear to us, all right? Now, in the book of Philippians in the second chapter, and uh, we're uh, not going to turn there right now, but uh, I just want to let you know that there is explained in those verses, during those verses, the fact that Jesus Christ did something in particular, before he was born. And the word says that he emptied himself, he, he took upon himself the form of a servant, and being fashioned as a man, he humbled himself unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, the cross and the name of what this message is about is found in, uh, I think, Galatians, God forbid that I should glory in anything save the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ by which the world was crucified unto me and I unto the world. In other words, there is something that is absolutely imperative with the church and the faith of the church did you know there are many religious broadcasts on today that never utter the word Jesus, never speak his name, never use his name? It's about God, but not about Jesus. And I want to tell you, the message is about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He is not happy with being made a prophet. He's not happy with other titles. When he asked Peter, who do men say that I am? Peter finally said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And what he said to Peter was, Blessed art thou, Peter, Simon Peter, for you didn't get this through man, but the heavenly Father has given you a divine revelation about who Jesus Christ is. And I want to tell you, when you get saved, it comes as a divine revelation that there is none other name among men whereby we must be saved. And that is the most important thing about the gospel is his name and what he has done through the cross. There's no cross, there's no redemption. 
If there's no cross, there's no sacrifice. If there's no cross, there's no salvation. We need to understand the cross needs to be the center and the circumference of all that we say and all that we do. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. All the way back, if you remember correctly, in the birth of Jesus and when he started his ministry at about 30 years of age, at the end of the uh, third chapter of Matthew, Jesus was baptized by water in John, uh, John baptized Jesus by water. And then the first uh, verse of the fourth chapter, it starts that the Spirit of God uh, d- drove Jesus up into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, whether you recognize it or not, and this is so important, Jesus, when he started his ministry, did what no other man had ever done or ever will do. And remember, Jesus, the only 200% man that ever lived. He was 100% God and 100% man. Can you say amen? He was God in the flesh, the Son of God. No one else has that title. No one else has ever claimed that title. He and he alone is the Son of God. And that is the key to his being the head of what we believe. Because it was him with the Father uh, and the Holy Spirit that planned redemption all the way back at Genesis 3.16. And he has given us the plan that there was a reason for uh, God to say that there's going to be the soul that sinned that shall die. And let us know that if you're guilty of sin that you're going to pay the penalty, but there was no other way. And finally, Jesus came on the scene, and, and when he went to battle with the enemy, he became the second Adam. Now, I want to read you some scripture, and I might have uh, a different translation than you. Uh, I'm, I think I'm in the King James right now here by this. And, but I want to read uh, uh, to you Matthew 26. 39 and 40. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And when he cometh unto his disciples that find them sleep, saith unto Peter, Why, What could you not watch with me but one hour? Now, this happened three times where he was looking for the disciples to come back to pray with him. This was one of the loneliest times of his life when all of a sudden by himself, carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders, Jesus was going to face the enemy. But I want to tell you what he had already done in the wilderness is Jesus took on the enemy in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And the areas that uh, first Adam failed in, Jesus Christ overcame sin, hell, and the grave, and then died, and then rose again from the grave, and said to everyone, the way is open, the veil of the temple has been rent in twain, We all can come before the throne of grace and make our wants and wishes known. Only the high priest could come. Now it was whosoever will. He made the way to offer our sacrifices unto him right directly. There's no one has to be in between God and us. The blood has been applied. Our sins are gone and we stand in his presence. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. And how blessed we are when we when we establish ourselves with Jesus Christ, not ourselves to have done anything. We cannot earn salvation or anything. You say, well, I thought we were going to receive some kind of rewards for our life. Yes, when we get to heaven, not to get to heaven, when we get there, we'll be rewarded and done, done the good, good things done in the flesh. God has taken care of that. But getting to heaven requires the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, faith in Him, trust in Him, and that one of these days we're going home to be with Him 
for all eternity. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. And do you know that in each case, when the devil came at Jesus in the, uh, in the wilderness, Jesus would say, It is written. It is written. It is written. And do you know he went into that place to be tempted by the devil right after he was baptized in water, right after the Holy Spirit came down on him like a dove out of heaven and that God had said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. It was after those experiences that Jesus went in as the second Adam. And what the first Adam lost, the second Adam overcame. And we thank God for that. Let me read to you here. Uh, I refer to the following verses to you today. That, that you may never have anyone, not even a minister, or for that matter, anyone else, tell you what I'm going to say to you here that was said to this lady that called. While I was listening to this preacher on the radio in the, one of the shopping centers, she asked what the call was about. He, she said, well, I'm calling because I have fear. And he said, well, sister, you don't need to worry about having fear. Jesus himself had fear. And my mouth dropped open and I'm saying, what in the world are you saying? To over the radio, to hundreds and hundreds of people listening. What are you saying? Jesus had fear. And then he said this. Do you remember him saying in Gethsemane, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Sure, Jesus had fear. He didn't want to die. And I guess I was talking to myself in that car, but I said, that's not true. And if I could crawl in that radio right now, I'd like to appear in front of you and tell you, you are misinformed. I don't know where you got your theology, but that's not right. Jesus came to die. He didn't fear death. He faced death for you and for me once and for all. It was something else that he was asking the Father. If it be possible, he asked him four times, I believe. If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. He's saying it was fear. I'm telling you, it was not fear. He had no concern about being, uh, facing uh, sin and uh, overcoming it. Well, I want to read you a couple of scriptures here. Mark 14, 36. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take uh, away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but thine be done. You see, in each case, when he said, if there's any other way to do this, do what? We're going to get to that in just a minute. What was it that he was going to do that was going to be so difficult for him? What was he facing that was going to be never, it was never done before by anybody and no one else but the Lamb of God could do what he did. No one else but the perfect Son of God can do what he did. Can you say amen to that? Nobody. Amen. I remember when I was toward the end of my time tenure at, at Agawam. I remember we had, I don't know, many hundreds out for the Christmas program. And I spoke at the end of the Christmas program that was presented four times, the singing Christmas tree. Hundreds, thousands came out to that. I think the mailing list we had of that by the time I got there was about 120,000. I could did it, cut it down to about 30,000, I think, because many of them, no sense sending dead people invitations to anything until the rapture. <laughs> when I think of dead people, I think of the preacher that had an argument and said that his, as far as he was concerned, that his church was going to be the first one up in the rapture. Another preacher said, that's not true. Say, yeah, it is in the Bible. He said, I can't be. He said, it is. He said, where is it? 
Well, the Bible says the dead in Christ are going to rise first, and my church is the deadest church I've ever been in my life. <laughs> Things do change. Can you say amen? amen? And how important that is in our lives that things do change and can be made different by the power of God in our lives. Well, I'm going to skip on here a little bit. <clears throat> Excuse me just a minute. I'm going to, uh, I just told you he prayed this four times in four different occasions there. But I want to turn your attention to the book of Romans and uh, the fifth chapter and the sixth verse. Actually, we're going to start at the yeah, sixth verse. Okay. For when we were yet without strength, this is Romans 5, 6, in the King James Version, I believe. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And I was going to finish the story I had that in the close of that Christmas program, I said to the people that were there, I said, just so you know that the persons whose birth we represent here at Christmas time, is the Son of God, the only sinless person that ever walked on the face of this earth. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Well, at the close of the service, a gentleman, I guess at that time you're a little older than me, if that's possible. Anyhow, he, he came up and met me on the platform, and he said to me, well, he said, did I understand you to say Jesus was the only one born without sin? I said, yes, sir. He said, what about the Virgin Mary? Now, if you're a uh, Roman Catholic background, I, yeah, I'm not saying this to hurt anybody's feelings. I'm telling you to tell the truth about this, that when Jesus was born, he was the only person born without sin. And this man said to me, did you not do not believe that Mary was immaculately concepted? In other words, Mary was born without sin. I said, no, sir. I said, and what you don't understand is that doctrine in the Catholic Church was not introduced until the 16th century. That was not from the beginning of salvation. Jesus Christ was the only person, will be the only person, there'll never be another one like him that was born without sin, and we need to stand up for Jesus no matter what happens. There's a young girl, just had a baby, that's going to be hung at one of the countries. For what? For her faith in Jesus Christ. She's going to be hung after that child is born, but they're going to give her two months to do something about to caring for the child for two months, hoping she will change her mind. She's not going to change her mind. Here's a young lady going to sacrifice her life because she believes that there's none other name given among men whereby we must be saved. I want the Lord to help us, me included, to pray for that young lady that God will give her the strength to be able to live through this horrible, it's bad enough to die, but to die by hanging to me is, is one of the most difficult of all things because it has to do with choking, suffocating, and everything else. But God can give her some kind of strength and divine help to be able to bring her through this. Can you say amen? And how we need that as well. Well, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died while we were sinners. He didn't save us because we were savable. 
He saved us because there wasn't any other way. It required, in God's law, death for sin. Somebody had to die. And if you weren't going to die or I wasn't going to die for sin, somebody had to die in our place. Now what they want to do, <clears throat> pardon me, is take Jesus out of the picture and not have him dying for the sins of the world. They want their gods to be the gods. But there's never be, it never has been, nor will there ever be another Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world but Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and how important that is. Now listen to these verses here. For if when we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. This is verse 10 of chapter 5, I believe. Much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, get this now, wherefore, young people, listen to this, no other way this could have been done. Therefore, as by one man, sin entered the world. Who was that one man? Adam. One man, sin entered the world. And death by sin. And so death passed upon all men. As a result of what Adam did, death passed upon all men. For that all have sinned. For under the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even though them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more, get the saints, much more, the grace of God and the gift by grace, the unmerited favor of Christ, which is what grace is, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. One man took us in this. One man's taking us out of it, dying for the sins of the world. There ought to be an applause for Jesus this morning. One man, one man, Jesus Christ, did this. And not only what by one man that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses under one justification. Verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they received abundance of grace, and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as the offense of one judgment came upon men to condemnation, even so the righteous of one, the free gift, came upon all men unto justification. We became part of that gift. We have received freedom from sin by the name of Jesus. You say that means that we're never going to sin again. That's not what I said. We're freedom from the penalty of sin because he's written our names in the Lamb's Book of Life. And as long as we live, in an attitude of confession. John said if we confess our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You and I don't have to fear about going. Whether we're going to heaven or not. If our names are written there. And we keep that open door. How about the song. Nothing between my soul and my savior. Thank God we can keep that open door. Into the holy of holies. And everybody said, Amen. Verse 9 is, By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one man shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered, and the offense might abound. That sin might abound, that grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto the eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, I have the same verses in the NIV. A one man, by one man, by one man, by one man. Thank God what we have. I want to have your, turn your attention here to going a little further. He fell on his knees again and prayed. 
if it be possible. What was it, Jesus? Why would Jesus pray such a prayer in, if in fact it was his reason for coming? What was there about what he was asking the Father? Each prayer was the same. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you want. Whatever you need to do, Father, I, I, if there was some other way, some other way about what? That's what I want you to know. I wish this place was full with young people that think all we hear today is tradition and all we hear today is, are the things that, that they're uh, summing up as being just uh, uh, rules of the church. I want to tell you what he's saying is if you are born of the Holy Spirit, God's going to ascend, uh, uh, believe that something in our lives are going to change. Can you say amen? What's it say in 2 Corinthians 5, 17? He who is in Christ is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. What's Romans 12, 1 say? I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed, verse 2, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might know what that good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. How we need to know what the will of God is for our lives. It's not a bunch of rules. It's a bunch about being changed by the power of God, having the anointing of the Holy Ghost come directly from Him to us. Remember in John 5, He said, I can of my own self do nothing. Everything He did, He was conceived of the Holy Ghost, born of the Holy Ghost, was empowered by the Holy Ghost, received baptism and the power of God in his life, faced the devil in the Holy Ghost. It was the Holy Ghost that raised him from the dead. And he said, now I'm going to send that power to you. And I want you to use that power that took me to glory. Because I've died for you. You are now able to be a temple of the Holy Ghost. Can you say amen? And how needful that is for us to accept and believe. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, he, let me read you this. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you, we pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. Listen, verse 21. Here's the first part of what Jesus wanted to go a different direction if possible. For he hath made him sin that knew no sin, that we might be made the righteous of God in him. He was about to experience something that he had never experienced throughout all eternity. He was going to experience something that was going to cause his father's face for the first time in eternity, to turn from him until he cried, oh, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. What was he saying? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It was this that he was dreading, not the death, but becoming sin. You say sin for who? Sin for everybody that has ever committed sin from the beginning of time until the beginning of eternity. Every person that accepts Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, it doesn't matter about your language, it doesn't matter what you've done, it doesn't matter what you've said or the lies we've told or anything else. It doesn't matter about our reputation we've ruined in the past. What matters is when you and I are born again is he has already borne the burden of every sin we've ever committed and we come out the other side redeemed by his blood and saved by the power of the Spirit of God. For Christ's love compels us we are convinced that he died for all, that those who live for him should no longer live for themselves, but for him 
who died for them. That's what he's saying. I told my nephew this morning before we left, God's blessed his life and he's going to be very, very wealthy if he isn't already. But I wanted to remind him that it's not what you have in this life, but it's what God's delivered us from. God isn't going to be upset at you that you didn't accept religion. But remember, God watched his son take the abuse of humans. God watched his son be nailed to a cross. He watched his son being whipped. He watched him bleed. He watched him die. For what? For the sins of the world. For yours and mine. God watched his son die. And I want to tell you, you just can't walk away from him like they walk away from religion. I want to tell you, he ought to be number one in all of our houses. We ought to be glorifying his name. Every opportunity we get, he's the greatest man that ever walked the face of this earth. No one will ever compare with him as the son of God. And everybody said, amen, and how truthful it is. Well, in conclusion, he was made to be sin for the entire world. And he prayed, if there's any other way, Lord, if we can do it any other way. He's never been involved with sin. If it were possible, let this cup pass from me. He finished praying the words, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. This was said by the greatest 200% man that ever lived. Emmanuel, God with us. Why? After Paul, did you ever stop to think in Philippians when Paul said, forgetting the things that are behind? How many have ever remembered that? Forgetting things that are high and pressed toward the mark for the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What do you think he had to forget? What do you think he had to leave behind? Do you remember? What were some of the things Paul had to leave behind? Very good, a little louder. Huh? Say? Religion? No, well, yeah. I was thinking what he was guilty of. What was he guilty of? He had sin, but what kinds of sin? What did he do? What did he do? Huh? Yes. He incarcerated Christians. He caused the death of Christians. He stood and held the coats for the men that stoned Stephen to death. Look what he did. But he was able to forget those things and leave them behind. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, that set him free from the guilt of sin that he did as a sinner. And then he became one of the greatest apostles that ever walked the face of this earth. He was that because God didn't save him because he was good. God saved him because of what he could become. God saved Peter not because he was good, but because of what Peter could become. God's not saving you and me because we're good. He's saving us because of what he can make with us. And if we follow him, he can make us fishers of men. He can put us in the lives of people to change their lives. That's what we're called to do by God's grace. Well, we're living in a world that right now is on the precipice of doing away with the, they've done away with Christmas. We've got bunnies instead of the resurrection. Every religious holiday is turned into something of a festival and lost everything that God put it together for. Our religious holidays have become a farce. They're doing it little by little. You can't speak out against sin. You can't preach against sin. Remember they did that with Peter and John? They let them out of prison. What they say to Peter and John? You can no longer speak in his name. 
you speak in his name, we're going to put you back in jail. 2,000 years ago, they told Peter and John, you can't use his name. They're telling us today, you can't close in a government prayer using the name of Jesus. This country was built because of the grace of God. This country was based upon Judeo-Christian principles. But they're telling us now we can't do that. But I'm glad what Peter said was so true it should be today. What was his answer? He said, whether it's right to obey God or man, judge ye. But we cannot help to speak what we have seen and what we have heard. Jail or no jail. Here's a man that ended up being crucified because of what he believed. But he wouldn't even let them crucify him right side up. He demanded he be crucified upside down because he wasn't worthy to die the same kind of death his Christ had died for him. We've had more people die in the early church. Church fathers burnt to the stake. One man, they were going to forget which one it was now. They were going to tie his hands. And he said, you won't have to tie my hands. They said, but you're going to be burned at the stake. He said, you won't have to tie my hands. And that man died with both hands raised to heaven as the flames consumed his life. I want you to know that some of us that don't serve God because of our petty differences of opinion about people or something else, I want to tell you we're going to be terribly disappointed if Jesus says to us, depart from me. I never knew you. We want to be included was welcome home, thou faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. That's why your meeting on Sundays is for that reason. And we thank God for that. I want to read to you a prayer that you might have heard. It was sent to me in the year 2008. It was a prayer in 2008. That's six years ago. And I want to tell you, the, the, the DVD that I was going to talk to you about, on the bottom line, I preached in Agawam, Massachusetts, to a congregation, actually to two congregations in two different meetings. It makes Jesus Christ and his blood the bottom line of everything that's to be preached. And I said things in Agawam 10 years ago that are coming to bear right now on our country. It's happening, and we got less and less. Do you know during Hitler's killing of 6 million Jews, only 23% of the evangelical churches in Germany said anything about what Hitler was doing was wrong? Only 23% raised their voice. The rest of the evangelicals didn't say anything about what he was doing. And I want to tell you, we've got people in our government today that are taking away our godly rights and privileges as a godly nation so that we're not even known as that anymore and end up being called the great Satan, which they say has the right to kill all of us because we're, that will glorify their God instead of ours. Listen to what Billy Graham said. Heavenly Father, we come before you today to ask your forgiveness and to seek your direction and guidance. We know your word says, Woe to those who call evil good. But that is exactly what we have done. Listen to this, kids, young people, listen to this. Billy Graham wrote this six years ago. We have lost our spiritual equilibrium and reversed our values. We have exploited the poor and called it lottery. We have rewarded laziness and called it welfare. We have killed our unborn and called it choice. We have shot our abortionists and called it justifiable. 
We have neglected to discipline our children and called it building self-esteem. We have abused power and called it politics. We have coveted our neighbor's possessions and called it ambition. We have polluted the air with profanity and pornography and called it freedom of expression. We have ridiculed the time-honored values of our forefathers and called it enlightenment. Billy Graham concludes his prayer by saying, Search us, O God. Know our hearts today. Cleanse us from every sin and set us free. I feel there's more left to this message, but I feel to conclude something with this written by Bunty Burke. I think it has to do with the cross. Our country is is being destroyed by our interest in everything else except the gospel. She says the pressure's on, Lord, and I don't much like it. This conforming to your image. You mean to say I'm supposed to be like you? Willing to be a servant, loving without being loved, ministering without reward, laying down my life for those who don't want life anyway, dying, yet going on to love, not for myself but for others. Is that really what it's all about, Lord? But it's what you did, isn't it? You turned the other cheek. And didn't answer back. You kept on sharing truth. No matter what was said. And you shared it in love with those who wished you were dead. You cared and kept on caring. Even when all your friends had fled. You prayed and kept on praying even as you bled to death. But oh that was you. That was your calling. Oh I see Lord. Lord. It's mine too, if I am to be conformed to your image and be like you. Can we bow our hearts in prayer, please? I'm going to ask Pastor to close in any way he wants to, maybe with a chorus in a few moments. But first of all, I don't know how many of you are going to be there tonight, but there's a burden on my heart for you, this church, for your board, for your pastor and his wife, for the families of this church. We've talked weeks about coming. I believe God's put a new, a whole new challenge in my heart and life. I believe he's born in both Wanda and me the true really the true meaning of salvation is being brought and freed from sin Lord may you fulfill the words of this chorus Lord have your way in our lives and as brother leads us in this chorus before he does is there one that will say Brother Ryan I I agree with what you've said and, and I would appreciate prayer that God would help me to lift up the blood stained banner of the cross and not to be t- depending upon things I have or things I want or things that are important to me but what's important to him And that's to bear the cross and him crucified for our sin. Anyone, anywhere, you'll slip up here and say, pray for me today. Pastor's going to dismiss in just a minute with a chorus. 
Anyone here say, Brother Ryan, I want to be a better witness than I've ever been before. And I'd like you to have prayer. Yes, God bless you and you. Are there others? Yes, amen. God bless you, the many, many raising their hands. Are there others? Yes, praise the Lord. Amen. I don't know how for sure how you close your Sunday morning services. But I'm going to ask Pastor. I, I love that song he's playing. I love I used to sing it as I was a teenager. I trust it'll be a blessing. Obey the Lord in this service today. God will bless. I'm trying to put one of these messages in writing. Pray for me that God will help me to do it. Pastor, please. Hallelujah.